So, um, I want to talk today about positive emotions and the importance of them. And this is something that we touch upon a lot right, in our in our practice and the things that we teach and the discussions we have with all of you. And the Buddha emphasized this uh, very strongly that we want to bring positive thoughts into the mind. We, Of course, we're not uh, trying to suppress uh, the challenges that we have. We need to turn towards them and work with them. But, but to work with part of that working with is also noticing when the mind goes negative uh, and to learn how to uh, effectively work with the causes of that and to learn how to settle that negativity out so that we can bring in positive, uplifting, true, um, helpful mental states so that we can make progress on the path. And so this, um, this idea of changing our mind, uh, especially if it gets into, you know, feeling, um, fear, anxiety, um, depression, uh, the negativity of going over thoughts that, that bring up more worry or more um, um, sadness. And like I said, we often talk about how to turn towards whatever it is that's bothering us and work through that. But today I wanna really focus on the positive emotional states and how to increase them. And so the Buddha, uh, like I said, very much encouraged this because really the, the, the mind that is happy and feels joy is easy, much more easy to um, bring into samadhi concentration. And w we can have mental habits that either kind of bring us down or lighten the mind and, and bring it up. So we're, I want to look at uh, these recollections. You know, we've, we've frequently talked about six recollections that the Buddha recommended for um, lifting up the mind. And they're, uh, just to name them again, having uh, reflections on the good qualities of the Buddha, also thinking in terms of the enlightened mind that we also have that in us and, and recognizing that all of those qualities are the potential for our, the development of our own practice. And then the qualities of the Dharma, the qualities of the enlightened Sangha, the reflections on our own acts of generosity, reflections on our own virtue. And then there's the part that for some people is a little harder to um, maybe feel is concrete enough, but reflections on the devas and the qualities that heavenly beings have and how we also have those qualities. So those six recollections are a common set that we see in the suttas that the Buddha encouraged us to use I want to put some attention on the fourth one I mentioned, the acts of generosity that we ourselves have done. And maybe it's not even just generosity, but the kinds of things that, if we recall them, bring joy in the heart, bring a smile to our face. And what's interesting about it is that um, there's actually a, a practice that can be used. Uh, something that I've talked about other, other times too. In Sri Lanka, there's this 
practice of writing down the things that you do that are kind and generous and putting that all in a book. And then when you're dying at the end of your life and you're dying, a family member or a friend reads that out to you as you're going through the process of your body shutting down or, you're, you know, whether you're um, still in communication or if you've already gotten to that place where maybe you're just hearing and you're not really talking anymore, regardless of when, this list um, coming back to you of the good things you've done in your life. Now, when I first heard about this, um, maybe 20 years ago, I got myself a book and there are the blank pages and a notebook and I couldn't think of anything I could write down. And um, just uh, recently we were listening to a talk by Ajahn Jayasaro, which I would recommend by the way, I think it's called uh, something about positive emotions practicing with positive emotions. If you want to look that up on YouTube, I think it's a good talk. Uh, but it's, he talks about using these, these, you know, like writing down 10 things that you've done in your life that bring joy to the mind. You know, and I'm finding that it, when I talk to people about this, they're often in the same place I was when I started to try to think about the good things I've done in my life. Like you can't think of anything. Now, I don't know if I say to you right now, could you write down 10 things that you've done in your life that, you know, when you think about it, it brings up joy, smile to your face, happiness. And he, he points out in his talk, you know, it's not um, things worldly things like, oh, I made a lot of money. And, you know, it's, it's the things that are, are coming from the heart, you know, a kind act uh, that you did for someone, uh, sharing something with someone, uh, helping somebody in some way, some act of, of kindness and generosity coming from the heart. And thank you, Adrian, for the link in the chat. Um, and, and, you know, really um, being able to reflect upon that and, um, and then he's, and then Ajahn Jayasaro suggests that as a meditation, you take each of those 10 things and you reflect on each one for three minutes. So like, you know, you, you, you think about it for three minutes, you let it lift up your heart, you go through each one, and then you've got a 30 minute meditation at the end of which hopefully the mind is very happy, um, you know, glowing with recollections of the beautiful things we've done um, to help others. Now, like I said, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or what, but there's such a strong tendency to maybe think of something and then go, well, but that's just normal stuff I should do. So um, I made a list after listening to Ajahn Jayasaro. And one of the things on my list was when I was married, um, um, this was the, uh, I was married twice and um, this was the person who um, actually gave, told me he didn't want to be married anymore and tell some of these stories about my life. And that was surprising because it was such a good relationship. But during the time we were married, he donated a kidney to his sister. And one of the things on my list was the way in which I cared for him during that time. You know, I took care of him with a, a lot of mindfulness and dedication and love. And, you know, it, it, one way to look at it is, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? You know, you take care of your partner, you take care of whoever it is that you're your, your friend or whatever. Um, yes. And you can feel 
joy in that, you know, your, um, your good action, even if it feels like, well, this is something that's just kind of part of my duty still, you know, recognizing that this is an act of generosity and kindness. Um, you know, another thing that I um, didn't put on my list, but like the first memory I have of feeling this kind of joy was when I was probably about eight years old and I was a brownie, you know, like a, a little Girl Scout. <laughs> and um, we had this um, activity where we made like woven with pieces of paper, a basket. And then we were able to put a bunch of goodies in the basket. And then we were taken out to different houses where older people lived. And we could, we were told to go put the basket on the doorknob and ring the bell and run away. And I remember just feeling so much joy about this, <laughs> you know, little kid doing something, um, actually having a hand in doing it to make the basket. And it was like, um, a, you know, that kind of feeling. And you can think, well, that's no big deal or whatever, you know. And, and so I want to I wanna challenge you. Um, see how many things you can write down in the next five minutes for yourself on your phone or on a piece of paper. Does anybody need a piece of paper? <laughs> I use my phone. Okay. <laughs> Gonna give you five minutes and I might say a few just encouraging words about what kinds of things. Um, some things are really complicated. Like when I was taking care of my mom when she was dying, you know, not everything went smoothly. There were things that if I focus on the, the very few things that I wish I had done differently, then the whole idea can just bring my mind down. So I can choose to put my attention on all the things that I did that helped, all the things that I did to save her from discomfort, to relieve her suffering, to support her mentally, you know? So really turning your mind to the positive, not requiring perfection, Thank you, Wandana. Some things we might put down are more general, but when we reflect on them, then the specifics might come up. Some things we might put down are more like momentary, specific. That's all okay. Some of these things might be internal, you know, like the ways in which we encourage our own mind or uproot our old patterns, things that we've made an effort to change in ourselves. Those are also good, kind, virtuous actions. It's 
Sometimes even just listening to someone can be such a supportive action. So Colin. At six things. Six. She's got six <laughs> and counting. <laughs> <laughs> I can probably tell her about 16 good things she's done for me that she's forgotten. <laughs> no, it's 1,600 things I think she said for me. <laughs> can I really be careful not to believe the mind when it wants to point out the one flaw um, and focus on that? I want to really appreciate our own goodness. I'm going to give you two more minutes or something like that. <laughs> How many people are finished? You can just raise up your physical hand. Oh, a few. You're supposed to make six. You said write six. Write ten. Ten. Okay. Ten. ten if you can do it. Not done yet. You need three more. Oh, you play with blueberry all the time. You're so proud. <laughs> <laughs> Blueberries are our contractors, three-legged dolls. Oh. So you funny. you picked me up at my apartment. Oh, that's a oh. good one. <laughs> <laughs> See, we have to help each other sometimes, you know. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Mira. <laughs> Grace picked me up today. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> oh, we had yeah. some here. Yeah. Did you want to say something, Phil, or are you just finished? <laughs> I'm just finished, thanks. Oh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I can imagine then um, the line of work you've had, you could probably make pages upon pages of things you've done. <laughs> and then the danger is you just say, well, that was my job, you know? Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> you could train a monkey to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> no! Just so you know, Phil was an ER doctor for a while. So. <laughs> I don't want a monkey working on me in the ER. <laughs> <laughs> She's not buying it, Phil. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Before we go into the meditation part, let's talk about the process of finding those 10 things. Does anybody have any, anything they'd like to share about that um, at all? You don't have to. <laughs> Just in case you have any comments or questions at this juncture. I have a comment slash question. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I forgot. To oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, Julie. Yeah. Um, how, like, when I, when we first began this exercise, my question was going to be like, well, what if you have so many things that you want to list and you're like, well, I'm just a great person, but then like, in the process of listing them, you really can't see just the goodness for everything that you notice. It's like pointing out all of the times that you haven't done your duty. Yeah. So yeah. on one hand, it's like writing a big list feels egotistical. Mm -hmm. um, and in a, on the other hand, writing a small list kind of also feels egotistical. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like really, this is a very good point. Um, if you listen to that talk of Ajahn Jayasaro, he actually brings up, you know, like 
at one point what it means when the Buddha talked about this, you know, like, let's say, um, we're reflection, reflecting on our own virtue. And if there's any kind of, this isn't what you're talking about, but if there's any kind of looking down on someone else for not being so virtuous, then the Buddha says, you're really on the wrong track. You're really, you know, missing it. And then in this case, like, um, this comment of, you know, like, you know, is this an egotistical thing that I think I'm, you know, doing so great? Well, notice when it is and when it isn't, because we can, we can observe our own good qualities without puffing ourselves up. And we can also observe the mental patterns that cause us to look at the negative side overly um, kind of emphasize the mistakes and the negativity without putting ourselves down too. And so we, it's good to kind of sort that out. What is really egotistical and what is just part of a pattern that we've developed through our conditioning. And we really want to, want to challenge our conditioning because, you know, so much of our behavior, so much of the way we think is a product of our conditioning. Like almost everything we do is really part of the conditioning that we've had. And as we train our mind, we're going against that conditioning. We're training it. Um, even the way we train it is conditioned, you know? So we want to watch out for those parts that are really not helpful, but to really sort out, well, when are we puffing ourselves up? When, when are we um, kind of reinforcing the sense of self? Uh, whether it's like you said, it's two sides of the same coin. If we're putting our puffing ourselves up or we're putting ourselves down, if it's focus on self, we're kind of missing the point. But if we if we are really just evaluating or noticing goodness, or we're noticing um, what brings that kind of joy to the heart, then we can we can get a sense of the difference. And and so we wanna we wanna start to develop that sensitivity. And and not to be upset if some of that ego stroking one way or another positive or negative is there but to see it and let it go and this is this is another part of learning how to train the mind we see the things that are not helping us grow helping us develop we see the things that are have a toxic kind of residue <laughs> and we learn how to how to set them aside, maintaining our kindness and compassion for ourselves. Thank you. Hannah? Yeah, I um, I was really glad that you asked us to do this because it was really lovely to reflect while I was doing this to see where I am in my practice today. And it was so, I was just filled with loving kindness for myself to recognize that I'm in recovery for codependency. And so if somebody had asked me to do this a year ago, I would say, oh no, I can't do that because that would be selfish. And mm -hmm. it totally goes back to what you were just talking about, the conditioning of growing up in American society, where if you talk about yourself at all, then you are egotistical and you are selfish and you aren't thinking about others. and then. A double whammy of that is I was raised in a Southern Baptist cult where it was especially bad to ever talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really releasing all of those causes and conditions to a point where today it was just a lovely exercise to think about like all the times that I got to connect with people with my generosity. Not so much about, oh, I'm doing something so great because my intention has changed. My intention now is just to connect with other people through acts of generosity and, and seeing how intimacy is, is built upon things like that. And it's lovely to know that I was able to let go of those conditions and continue to do so. And 
And I'm just really glad and I'm excited to get a book like you talked about and just really write this stuff down. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, Carrie and Jaime. By the way, hello, Jaime. I can see you there now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or maybe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, as, as I thank you for that. I like, I love the idea of making the list also. But what I'm noticing on my list is that very often uh, my acts of generosity are really driven by either of my need to ease my own pain in, to, by easing somebody else's suffering. I can mm. ease my own pain. So I guess it's kind of linked into compassion. Um, so I wondered if you could just like say a little something about um, generosity kind of being a two-way street because I really often feel like I need to do this so that I'll feel better and I get a lot of satisfaction from easing the situation for other people, but it's also to bring me ease, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, this is, thank you, Carrie. This is an important, I'm really glad I, this is an important area to to develop this discernment that you're pointing at of noticing when we're relating to the suffering of others and we're feeling maybe a sense of urgency to relieve their suffering because we are suffering and we want that to go away. And a lot of times um, we're not so aware of that motivation. And when that's not um, clear to us, uh, sometimes the actions we take are counterproductive because we're really interested in getting, getting past this feeling we're having. And we, we might not really be able to see what's for the benefit of the other person because we're caught up in our own suffering. And I'm not hearing that in what you're saying, but I like that you're identifying that difference. And I think that that's very important to recognize, you know, what really motivates our actions. And when we are um, really, really feeling a lot of uh, pain or suffering in ourselves because of a situation that's outside of us, what we want to do is turn if, if we have the opportunity, we we'll try to create the opportunity to work with what's going on in us separately from our um, actions to relieve the suffering of the other person. And we want to still take action to help them. But we also want to notice that what we're experiencing for ourselves is a separate issue and, and to take care of that turn towards that, especially um, what I find to be really effective is instead of being engaged at all in what the, the, the I'm going to say story, but it's not just a story, instead of being so engaged in whatever the other person's situation is and their experience, to really look at okay, that triggered what is coming up in me, but what's coming up in me is from my own history, my own karma, my own unresolved, um, unaddressed, um, you know, stuff. So, so to be able to have that understanding of the, the separateness there and to be able to really turn towards what's arising in myself, um, Someone I was talking to earlier today was talking about, you know, there's that being touched, something's being touched, like that contact, you know, you're, it's, it's, um, there's what's touching you. And then there's what's, what's being touched. So it's, it's like, there's, there's the contact and then there's what it, what it brings up in us. And what we want to do is work with what's what's be, being brought up in us, because that's where we get the the um, opportunity to heal, the opportunity to resolve what's happening inside. This is old stuff. This is stuff that comes from the past. 
this is the trauma maybe that we've experienced and we have that chance to work with that. And it's a separate thing from what's actually touching us, which is what that other person's suffering is or whatever they're um, telling us or whatever we're hearing that then brings up what's touched. So, um, you know, of course, the, the Buddha had all of this understood. It's really in the first three noble truths. And then the work, the effort, the care, the healing um, of what's being, being touched. Um, that's, that's really where we can, um, can, you know, do our own work. When that work is made, carried all the way through, and um, our own um, felt experience is well understood and cared for. Then when other people, someone else is suffering, what comes is really true karuna, true compassion. It, it doesn't have a, um, a personalized element in it anymore. It's one of the Brahma Viharas that's this exalted immeasurable state of wanting the suffering there in that other person to end and being able to really um, engage selflessly with supporting the ending of that suffering. And it's not like we have to like wait until everything's resolved inside of us to take those steps to help someone else. But what's useful is having the, the discernment to see those various components in play and knowing where to put the effort, um, the effort to help someone else, really trying to understand what's best for them without our own needs getting involved and then our own needs being supported and helped by our own internal work and maybe with the help of, you know, a professional or a, a Kalyanamita friend or you know, the work using the Buddhist teachings. Um, and then we have this note in the chat. A challenge I found in making the list was that some of the acts that I reflected on begin with generosity and joy and then turn into obligations that start to feel very heavy and less joyful. Good point. Okay. Um, this is another really important piece to unpack and to recognize, you know, um, I'm sure that that whole um, process of looking at the codependency kind of dynamic, for example, can, can have a lot of this same kind of work to heal or to understand and to really, you know, notice the quality of heart that starts that, uh, that process out of that joy and that giving and then starting to really bring the wisdom in to know where our boundaries need to be with where we, what we are offering and where, it, where we have to put the boundary about where that stops so that it doesn't become, um, wow, we've got a lot of activity out there in the air tonight, today. <laughs> Um, some kind of, who knows, um, I don't know if you can hear me all right over the sound. You can do your best. We can still hear you. It's, okay. it's, it's just a lot of background noise, but it's not a problem. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mayra. So, so this idea of being um, aware that there, it is, it's ex not just acceptable, it's essential to know where our boundaries need to be in terms of what we're offering, you know, and, and so that we can offer really with wholeheartedly and then, okay, this is what I can do and this is what I have the time for or this is what I have the energy for or this is what I have the resources for and it's in, in the Buddhist teachings, he's incredibly practical. He's never saying, oh, you have to give everything you have. He tells people, save a certain amount of money, keep your resources that you need to take care of yourself and your family, 
do, you know, the things that, you know, like have this portion that you can freely give for the support of others, but knowing where those, you know, sensible amounts are. And that's not just in financial things or physical resources. It's also our emotional resources, our time, um, you know, and so this is important. And, and even, even something like taking the time and doing the practice to understand where those boundaries are is something we can be happy with, happy about and proud of in our own practice. We can put that on the list, <laughs> you know, like this is a, this is an, an effort that I'm making that makes me a more reliable and, and a more grounded and a more um, stable person in our happiness and in our clarity. And that this too is, is, a, is a good action. Thank you, Steve. Um, Lakshmi? I wanted to share my experience very briefly. Um, growing up in an enmeshment, um, there was always a lot of guilt associated with keeping track of what you did for others. Um, so I'm, I was kind of fighting that conditioning that was ingrained in me while preparing the list. So it, it made me realize that that's a pattern that I need to unlearn for um, my own spiritual journey. Yeah. Just want to hear that. Yeah, thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah, guilt. Wow, what a challenge, um, you know, to feel bad about things um, that we're doing that are good, just feeling bad about acknowledging them or feeling bad about, you know, um, any kind of misstep we make or whatever, you know, there's, there's really no place for that in the development on the path. Um, the place uh, that it holds is to, again, use discernment to see the difference between Hiri Otapa and this kind of toxic way of thinking that pulls us down, shames us, makes us feel bad about ourselves, that that, that that the place for that is actually identifying it as, as a, a negative emotion, a, um, a devaluing of, of ourselves that's a kind of defilement. And, you know, and maybe defilement isn't altogether the best word, but it's the only one I, that's the one we <laughs> happen to have, you know, that we use sometimes in the translation. And, and it's, it's to see the, those, those mental qualities that are actually um, debilitating and to let those go. So thank you for that sharing, Lakshmi. Yeah, Mayor. Two things. The first is just a question. If you do it every night, how many qualities are you supposed to write down each night? Oh, no, you don't do it every night. Okay. I like that. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> you can just, you can just, if you want. I mean, I think it's a good idea to make a, a running list. Uh -huh, okay. Um, and you don't have to, the idea is if you have these 10, you could use them over and over again if you oh, want to. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you just you just take like three minutes each to, you know, just bring that to mind. And you can you can use the same ones over and over again. And then and then once you've sat for 30 minutes and you've brought each of these to your mind and you've, you know, had this opportunity to kind of like fill, you know, fill yourself with joy, then continue meditating. 
go go to your meditation object, like your breath, your breath. Um, That's like 30 minutes if you did all 10 of them. Yes. 30 minutes of that and then go, okay, that's helpful. And then go on with your regular meditation. So obviously you're going to have a block of time here. That's, you know, like a good significant oh, wow. amount of time to build up the joy in you and then go into meditation, into your normal meditation routine. Okay. So the thing I wanted to notice is that um, the ones that bring the most immediate joy are all um, something that had to do with Donna to the Sangha. Mm. So I just thought that was interesting. I, there's others I can connect to and remember, and it takes a minute, but for this, the immediate, I thought that, I just thought that was interesting to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not the only one. I, we know someone um, who's who's been exploring where she wants to become a nun. So she, you could tell she's, and she she started, the, the greatest joy she talked about was bringing a meal to the monastery. You know, to it was actually not our monastery, but you know, to be able to give to the sangha, uh, to the monastic sangha, and the reason that brings so much joy, and I know it from my time as a lay person, bringing gifts to the sun, giving like monks in Thailand LED flashlights, and being so like happy that I could do this, and they didn't have this stuff, and it was just uh, fun, you know. And it's like I, the Buddha talks about how uh, when we give a gift to someone who's really keeping um, a high level of virtue, uh, there is much more of a feeling of that joy. There's much more of a of a expansion on the the act of generosity when we're and when we our own selves have a pure mind in the giving there's much more of a magnification of the karma of that the joy of that and so it gets he says you can it, it gets purified by the giver it gets purified by the one you're giving to and so you know the best uh situation is when we are giving in a way that's conscious and happy and on the other side, the person is virtuous and accepting that in a very selfless way. And um, But we also don't need to have every perfect condition. We can do something really kind and generous. And maybe the person on the other side isn't so virtuous and, and uplifting, but that gift from our heart of, of generosity and um, just that pure desire to be of help is still, you know, really beautiful. And, you know, to really, to really acknowledge all of those possibilities of goodness. I would just add one more piece to it, which is that I think it's the conditions of giving where it's part of what's then like really known and valued and celebrated together. Like I have this memory for my birthday, giving a, a meal offering to Aloka Vihara during their retreat time. And I think it was, it has a lot to do with the way it was received and the, the space of allowing that. So somebody else was talking earlier about like just all the different things that get, you know, mingled in with giving and receiving that are, that are more in the shadow side of things. But I think because it's, it's held in the the bright side of it, that, that's that's my experience of part of why it's so excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank, so, you. thank you. This is a great practice today. Yeah, but I also want to say that even if what we're doing isn't appreciated, you know, we give we give something with our heart open and with all of our good intentions and is the skill that we we have to give it. And it isn't appreciated or it isn't noticed or it isn't, you know, received. It's okay. That's out of our control. It doesn't, you know, it, it's, I can't say like, oh, it doesn't matter. But at some level, we have to appreciate what's here in us yeah. and what we're doing uh, too. Yeah. Yeah. So another something from the chat, some of the things I listed were acts of generosity, but 
the thing things that bring up very sad memories. Yeah. Do I set those aside or just consider the things that bring and just consider the things that bring joy? For instance, laying flowers at a place of a homeless man was beaten to death makes me think of the darkness in this world. Taking care of my daughter's body after she died makes me think more about her death than what I did for her at her death and while she was alive. Ah, yeah. I think maybe noticing what it's like to reflect on those things and how our reflection on them changes over time. You know, because it's okay to feel the, of course, whatever comes up, it's okay to feel that sadness and also to bring the appreciation more and more in the mind of the good that you've done, of the good things that have come from what you've done. Like, you know, I, I put on the list taking care of my mom, like I said, when she was dying. And she died in 2017. And for a long time, I was really much, my mind would much more go to the two or three things that I felt like I did or decisions I made that weren't good, that I, that I think if I only knew more, it's the first time I'd ever helped anyone when they were dying. I didn't know certain things. And I had to work with that pattern anyway in my mind of bringing up the things I've done wrong. Like I'm so conditioned from childhood to reflect on what I've done wrong and not on what I've done that's good. And we're conditioned to that way anyway through evolution. Evolution wants us to think about the mistakes we've made over and over and over and over and over and over because that's more likely to keep us alive in order to procreate or whatever evolution is, you know, that's what evolution wants. Evolution wants us to survive, but it doesn't care if we're happy. So I say that often and it's true. And it's, it also doesn't have any interest in us becoming enlightened. And so it's like, you know, we tend to go over the mistakes much more than we do the positive things. And we need to then address that by intentionally reflecting on the positive. So what I noticed in writing this list was that I could put down the way I cared for my mom and those mistakes had faded into the background. It's not like I've forgotten that that happened, but to be able to recognize that like 97% of it was good. And that's where I can put, especially the attention on my own heart, my own intentions as I was helping her, you know, like, and if you, if there are negative in, you know, like we, none of us can control the fact that some selfish idea will come into the mind or some, you know, negative, um, kind of impulse or whatever, but the fact that we don't follow it, that we're not acting upon that negativity, that also is a sense of encouragement to us. And to really train, train ourselves, encourage ourselves to put the attention on the good and, and acknowledge those things that are hard and letting that settle. Um, and so it's, it's really um, an alive, changing process, the way we use our mind. You know, what part of that experience are we going to emphasize? What part are we going to reflect on again and again? The Buddha says that actually the sadness 
Uh, reflecting on that again and again doesn't help anyone. It's interesting. But he's not talking about suppressing our feelings. He's talking about being present with those feelings when they arise, but when the mind wants to go over the negativity, that doesn't help anyone. And so, you know, just, just starting to kind of tease these things apart a bit. And of course we're gonna have that mixture with these situations that are so, carry so much importance for us. And to, you know, really start to emphasize and, and grow the attention that we have on the good, to encourage more good arising in the future. And when we think about someone we love who's passed away, also bringing in where they have where they have gone and the good in them, the good in their life, thinking about the good in my mom and how I, I'm confident that that goodness is carried along with her into the next phase of her journey and how beautiful that is. And like when we, you know, take people's names and we, we remember them when we do our chanting and meditation and, you know, like teachings and share the merit. It's like all of that encouragement for the good, encouragement for the good in them, in wherever they're going next, you know. And this too is an act of goodness. This is like we share, share the merit of, of your practice with ah, the homeless man your daughter, your mother, your father. Encourage that, that joy, that goodness, that kindness, generosity, virtue. And encourage the mind to be happy. Jonathan? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So much, so much stuff going through my head. I'm like trying to just like be still with it and stay present. Um, you know, it's, it's just like, so it's so funny, right? How like it's almost seen as like this noble thing to like beat up on self with all the things that we've done wrong. You know, it's almost seen that way. Like, Oh, like I, I need to like, and you know, like flagellate myself. Right. But to then think of the good, it's like somehow a, a, a burden or whatever. And, I learned early on in, in 12 step recovery through doing like inventories there that the true humility is actually just an honest assessment of oneself. Mm -hmm. I don't, right. Like, and I, I learned to take inventory and, and to get us there, it was like often said, like, think of taking inventory in a store. You're just like looking at what's on the shelves. Oh, like this stuff's rotten. This stuff's good. It's like, it's objective. It's not like a, I've got some great peaches. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just what's on the shelf. <laughs> Right. It's just what's it's just what's here. We all have good and bad. That's just the facts, right? And like and I know for myself it's been it's been hard, you know, like historically it had been much, much easier to like think of the harmful things and the damaging things, but like through practice it's gotten it's gotten far easier. And and some of the reasoning behind that is, is so interesting too, right? Like, you know, like I think about motives and things for doing for doing kindness and and through my own codependency, I often find myself trying to give things to people that didn't want them or ask for them or, or maybe even need them. Just I thought that. And then it was met in a way. And then I realized like, oh, this is my own selfishness. I'm just like trying to fix things. But then like when I give in a way that's like just from like the right motives, it's, it's these things that stay with me forever and they will stay with me forever. These things that I can easily recall like, oh, like this, this kid was in pain this one day at work and he just had these like horrible, he had street feet, you know, he's a homeless dude and, and there's nothing I could do for him. There's nothing I could say. No way I could fix it. It was just blithering. All I could do was rub his back, and I did. And I just felt like so connected to like divine goodness in that moment. And it was like it, it was nothing like nothing about like the the me, the self, that Jonathan's information or wisdom or anything like this. It was just like a, a simple act of human touch, and like things like this. Like they they fill me with they fill me with like joy that that I, that I know that this is like pointing to you know. And it's like uh, 
and like I, I actually do this in my own inventory and so I'm really looking forward to that Sri Lankan practice I'm like I'm like I'm like I'm doing this with my life I'm doing it <laughs> <laughs> you know like it's so powerful but like before I go to sleep at night like I do my inventory of like what went well what didn't go well etc but I always end with reflect on my good qualities and, and like and it's just so in line with that right like as I go to sleep whether it's the final sleep or a nightly sleep remember what I did that was good here Yes. Aww. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. So true. So beautiful. Thank you. Joyce. Okay, I'm going to try to collect my thoughts. I find it really difficult to be listening and then speaking because I don't find it easy to speak. Um, this was a you speak very well. I want you to know, regardless of how it feels. <laughs> I sometimes leave this with a lot of judgments, but anyway, thank you for saying that. Um, this was a challenging exercise for me. At first, I just couldn't get started because I was trying to think of big things. Mm -hmm. And I, then I started to um, realize there were these tiny little things. And I started to look at what were my motivations and some of the things that I wrote down. And I kept on finding not so much like focusing on alleviating, uh, alleviating suffering, but to create ease. Now, this is going to be such a simple little thing, but I've been doing this forever and ever is being really careful to like hold the door for someone behind me. Mm. You know, just... Mm -hmm. I don't know if that even counts, if I should put that on the list, but I just seem... Counts, it counts, yes. <laughs> well, it made me recognize that I actually have more awareness than I thought I had. Because in order to do that, I've got to be aware that there's somebody else who's going to be affected by what I do. Yeah. And, um, and years and years ago, when I first started to practice, I took on a practice of... Because um, we have a lot of people here who don't have homes. And um, and you just you see this all the time, and just to just give, just just do it because I can. I'm just going to do it, and it's really changed my life and my attitude. Um, but it's not coming from a place that you know I have and they don't. And it's it's more about I don't know creating ease. And um, I used to belong to a project was called the Dharma Egg Project. And uh, there was a, a program, a breakfast program, and they ran out of funding in order to provide eggs to the people who needed the breakfasts. Mm -hmm. And so they came to all the sanghas and asked, could you buy 15 dozen eggs and donate them a month? Mm -hmm. And that was such a wonderful project. Mm -hmm. I just jumped into that with both feet. And, um, but again, it's wanting to provide ease and filling a need rather than, I guess it is relieving suffering, but that's not really quite my orientation. So I just like your feedback on that. Well, I think it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's like we, I think it's really good to notice that it's the opening of the heart, the, the, that feeling of what it's like to be free of stinginess, you know, to, to have that openness of the heart in that moment, you're free of fear. In that, in that moment when you're opening the heart, you're giving something from, you know, without the sense of self from wanting anything in return, then we're, we're free of anxiety, we're free of, of dukkha in that moment. And it doesn't have to be big, it can be, anything any anything it can even be kind thoughts you know we really have the opportunity every moment to open up this way and give even if we're you know <laughs> like i knew someone who was a quadriplegic he was in a care home and he couldn't nothing below the neck worked and he actually had a a way of turning on the computer and being able to to look at he looked at all these spiritual sites and he said 
his physical life was horrible, but his spiritual life was so much better after, you know, this change happened, happened to him. And, you know, it's like the opening of the heart, um, the, the wish for others to be happy and free, the movement of our own mind from, from negativity and fear and, and any kind of ill will or, or of, you know, aversion to, to one, to a space of kindness and compassion, any of the Brahma Viharas to, you know, to a, a virtuous selflessness. In that moment, in that moment, we are free of all those down-pulling defilements. And it doesn't matter if it's a big thing or a small thing, it's about the quality of heart. Yeah, thank you for um, just putting this in the context of the Dhamma practice, because I don't think I've always held it that way. And um, there was another thing, like a friend of mine, she was quite elderly and she ran out of money, basically. So she ended up in a care home away from her community. And a group of us would drive up every week to sing with her because she was mm -hmm. a folk singer. And it completely transformed the whole um, facility because everybody started to sing with us. <laughs> and they all started to learn the songs, even people with some dementia and whatever, they would know the words to the songs. And I just re now just recognize how joyful I felt when I was there. I don't always see my response or really like validate it. So this has been a really great opportunity to do that. So thank you. I hope that, I hope that one's on your list, Joyce. <laughs> you know what? I just added it just a moment ago. <laughs> how beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So to even like reemphasize re that, this is part of what leads us to samadhi. You know, the reason for these recollections is to settle the mind, get it, you know, move in the direction of being able to let them let go, let go into stillness. It all works together. Yeah. Chess? You mentioned opening of the heart, opening the heart, analogous to opening the door. Mm -hmm. It makes me happy to think that I'm opening to making you happy. Mm -hmm. I'm easing your burden by n not, you know, I'm helping you not push that door i'm opening that door so that your passage is lighter easier mm -hmm. yeah lovely thank you chess well friends the time has passed and i want to thank everyone for their practice and um, maybe next time we'll get around to the 30 minute reflection <laughs> on our 10 things. <laughs> and um, I hope you get a chance to practice that um, before we meet next time. So thank you, everyone. I have a feeling we should just chant a short blessing. Okay. <clears throat> And you can bring to mind everyone that you'd like to share merit with from your practice, from your heart. <coughs> may you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Buddhas. May you ever be well. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the Dhamma. May you ever be well. 
May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of all the sankha. May you ever be that sounded like with the natural sound off, but I hope you got the message. <laughs>